trade, business, tourism and innovation top the agenda as China hosts the Prime Ministers of Australia and New Zealand in separate visits. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington DC and this is The Heat. this month, China welcomed delegations from Australia and New Zealand for separate rounds of bilateral talks. Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull made his first visit to Beijing and Shanghai with a delegation of 1,000 business leaders. During the two-day trip, Turnbull met with Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and President Xi Jinping, hoping to capitalize on China's transition from an export-based economy to one that's consumer-driven. China and Australia sealed a free trade agreement in 2014, creating more opportunities for trade and engagement between the two countries. China is Australia's largest trading partner. New Zealand Prime Minister John Key also received a warm welcome from Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and President Xi Jinping in Beijing. This was the sixth visit for Key, who is working to negotiate a better free trade agreement with China's leadership. New Zealand was the first country in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development to sign a free trade agreement with China in 2008. China became New Zealand's largest export market in 2014. The two sides signed five cooperation agreements in areas including agriculture, finance and education. Joining us now from Sydney is James Lawrenson. He's the Deputy Director of the Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology. From Beijing, we're joined by Victor Gar. He's a Chinese international relations expert. With us from Wellington in New Zealand is Tony Brown. He served as the New Zealand Ambassador to China from 2004 to 2009 and was part of the delegation that just visited Beijing. And here with us in our Washington DC studio is Saurabh Gupta. He's a senior fellow at the Institute for China-America Relations. Thanks to all of you for joining us. James, let's start with this uh, trade relationship between Australia and China. Uh, as we've been reporting, uh, one third of Australian exports go to China. That's a pretty big market for the Australians. But with the Chinese economy now slowing down, is there a risk that could there could be a drop in demand for Australian goods and services. And how would that impact Australia? Yeah, so that's been the big fear over the last five years as China's economy transitions towards consumer and services-based growth. What's, going, what's that going to mean for China's demand for our iron ore? Well, we have the answer and the news is pretty good. Um, over the last five years, the iron ore price has collapsed. It's now a quarter of what it was in 2011, but Australia is ex actually exporting $20 billion more of goods to China each year and $5 billion more of services each year. So China's economy is diversifying. Um, um, and we're seeing new areas of Chinese demand for Australian goods and services, agribusiness products, tourism, um, international education, all these sorts of things are actually booming in Australia because of Chinese demand. Victor, the Australian Prime Minister brought with him a delegation of 1,000 business leaders. That's a pretty big delegation by any measure. What do these two sides want from each other? Well, I would say China-Australia relations, especially on the economic and trade side, are very close. And I think in the coming years and decades, it will become further strengthened, mainly because China, as the largest economy in the world, uh, in, if we measure by purchasing power parity, and the second largest economy in the world, if we use uh, official exchange rate to uh, benchmark, will continue and remain the largest uh, trading partner of Australia for decades to come. It depends on the wisdom and the ingenuity of both the Australian side as well as the Chinese side as to how to give greater premium to the prospect of economic and trade relations between the two countries. And I would say the Chinese demand for a variety of Australian goods and services, not only purely on the commodity and mineral side, will increase and Chinese tourism definitely will become more and more welcomed in Australia. All these indicate that if China and Australia put their acts together, further engage with each other, then the potentials will surprise us on the upside. Ambassador Brown, let's look at the relationship between New Zealand and China. Uh, New Zealand already exports agricultural products to China, dairy, meat, uh, olive oil, things like that. Uh, you were part of that New Zealand delegation that went to China. How does your country now expect to expand that relationship with China?
Well, the scenario that James laid out from the Australian perspective is, is very similar to the way that we see things in New Zealand. We don't have iron ore and our trade is not underpinned by a minerals trade. But across the range of products, and they go beyond agricultural products, that we are trading with China, we see the continued growth of the Chinese economy as offering a long-term, very secure and very profitable basis for New Zealand companies to engage in trade with, with that country. Because China is now, not actually now our largest trading partner because of the collapse in the price of, of, of dairy products and of, milk, of skim milk powder in particular, it's ducked slightly under the amount that we, we trade with Australia. But it is still on a par with Australia as one of our two largest trading partners and we don't see that changing. So Rob, Australia signed a free trade agreement with China last year. New Zealand has had one since 2008. How do these agreements impact trade between all these countries? Is, is it just a case of dropping tariff barriers and taxes or is there a lot more to it? It has for the most part been about tariff barriers and, and, and taxes. It has not been so far much to do with behind the border barriers as yet which are going to be taken down significantly in agreements like the TPP, etc. But there is some degree also of regulatory coherence, etc., etc., between the two sides. So this doesn't, it, it's not just limited to tariffs only. There's also some degree of harmonization and some degree of, of, of coherence in other areas. Particularly when you have things like services trade, uh, tariffs really is not, is, not the, is not the primary impediment in that regard. It's about deferring regulations between countries. And it is to China's immense benefit to have trade with advanced service supplying countries because it can get, upgrade and upskill its own regulatory infrastructure in these areas, which, is, which still has some work to do. James, as China moves away, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's made its intentions known. It wants to move away from an export-driven economy to a consumer-oriented one. Uh, what kind of opportunities does that present for Australian companies? And in which sectors are we likely to see the biggest growth? Yeah, so the, the two big ones that people talk about in Australia are, first of all, premium ag agribusiness products, so pr premium food products. So we're seeing big jumps in Chinese demand for Australian wine, beef, dairy products, for example. And the other area is in the context of services. So we've traditionally sold a lot of education services and tourism to services to China. Well, that's continuing to increase. And at the same time, um, there's also Chinese demand for financial services, health services. And these will be a bit different because what they'll involve is Australian companies, instead of exporting them from an Australian base, they'll need to set up shop in, in China and sell them to the Chinese market from the Chinese base. So it's a new phase of the bilateral trade relationship. Victor, I want to move now to another aspect of the relationship. Uh, this week, Australia awarded France a deal to supply submarines worth $40 billion. Uh, let's take a listen to what the Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull had to say about the deal. These submarines will be the most sophisticated naval vessels being built in the world. And they will be built here, in Australia. Built in Australia, with Australian jobs, Australian steel, Australian expertise. And this will secure our future security. And it secures, as does every lever of policy that we can engage, it secures our successful transition to the economy of the 21st century and the jobs which our children and grandchildren are entitled to expect. So Victor, what does China make of this deal? Well, first of all, uh, based on the fact that China-Australian relations are as good as we can expect, especially on the trade and economic side, from the Chinese perspective, we hope Australia will remain a, fa a force standing firmly for peace rather than, you know, uh, adding to the side of potentials for war or conflict in this part of the world. The fact that Australia is going to acquire all these submarines at very, very expensive cost to the public uh, is a concern for China. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, Australia and the United States uh, 
have a pact of mutual defense, and Australia is more or less moving in tandem with the United States. Therefore, we urge that Australia will become a force of good offices between Washington and Beijing, rather than you know, siding with one side against the other. Because if China and U.S. relations uh, get uh, deteriorating in the coming years or decades, then Australia will need to make that very, very difficult choice of siding with one or the other. The better choice for Australia is to use all its wisdom and become a force advocating for peace and dialogue and diplomacy, rather than a force eventually engaging in war and conflict. Ambassador Brown, do you think these countries have to make a choice? I mean, how do you look, how does New Zealand look at this? Here's a country like New Zealand, Australia for that uh, as well, for that matter. Uh, they've had traditional security relationships with the United Kingdom, with the United States. Do they now have to uh, get into some kind of balancing act to balance Chinese economic importance against America's strategic significance? Well, I think firstly, from a New Zealand perspective, we are in a different situation from Australia, slightly. We don't have a security pact with the United States. We don't have any pretensions to being a distant, wa distant water naval power. We do not have submarines, and we, we have a very limited naval capacity. But we do have a driving con uh, con uh, consideration in our diplomacy and in our defense policies that we have no wish ever to find ourselves in a situation where we have to make the choice that Victor's talking about between Australia and between Ch China and the United States. We have strong relationships with both. We certainly want to work with both in terms of regional security, in terms of global security. We have bilateral military defense, security, political, economic relationships of great importance with both China and the United States. And we don't see ourselves at any time in the, in the immediate future looking to have to make a choice between one side or the other. Right, and so Rob, if we look at cooperation between all three countries, getting back to economic cooperation, uh, of course, Australia and New Zealand excited at the prospect of having a market of 1.3 billion people open to them. But if we look at a sector like tourism, there are big advantages for all three countries, aren't they? Enormous, enormous advantages, um, particularly with the, with the outbound Chinese tourists. And there's this immense desire to go out and see the world, and they've, had, they've, they've managed to gain that sort of prosperity to be able to make their first trips abroad. A lot of them are going out, and, and of course you'd like to go to Paris and you want to go to go and see New York and all, but Australian cities, I have not been to New Zealand, but I've been to Australia, and Australian cities are beautiful. Shame and and, 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 and particularly uh, in Sydney, they will end up in Sydney and they will see more Asian Australians out there than they will probably see white Australians in Sydney, so they will feel so comfortable at home. This is a, going to be a huge revenue earner. And it will it's, it'll also help them place China in perspective of the larger world. So I think this is, uh, this is a win-win game for both sides, totally. Oh, at least you've made James smile, yeah? Uh, James, Chinese investment in Australia grew 60% to $15 billion. In fact, according to the Guardian newspaper, Australia is now the second most favored nation for Chinese investors after the United States. A lot of that money goes into real estate in Australia. What are the other sectors where the Chinese are investing in Australia? Yeah, so there's been a big change over the last five years. Um, you're quite correct. The Australian um, Foreign Investment Review Board said last year that we welcomed, uh, we approved $50 billion worth of Chinese investment. That was double the approved investment from the US, so China is now a big investment partner for us. Uh, five years ago, most Chinese investors went into the resources sector. That's completely changed. Um, as you say, uh, real estate is now the most popular sector for Chinese investors. That's not just residential, that's commercial real estate as well. Um, we also have enormous Chinese interest in our agricultural sector and in the services sector as well. So responding to all those Chinese tourists, for example, um, we now see a lot of Chinese property companies interested in building hotels and other tourist infrastructure in Australia. That's good for Australia. It creates Australian jobs. Um, but it's also good for Chinese tourists because when they come to Australia, there's a lot more that we can offer them. So again, it's a win-win.
Okay, we are going to take a break right now. More of our conversation about China's economic ties with Australia and New Zealand right after that. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat. Welcome back to The Heat. We're discussing China's economic and trade partnerships with Australia and New Zealand. Let's get back to our panel. Let's go to Victor. Victor, since Malcolm Turnbull took office in Australia, the United States has increased activity in the South China Sea. Is that a coincidence? Well, first of all, I think uh, there are reasons why the United States are particularly interested in inserting itself militarily into the South China Sea. It does not demonstrate a caring for peace and stability in the South China Sea region. I think from the Chinese perspective, we interpret that act of the United States as a deliberate attempt to derail the peaceful rise of China, which will be a disaster, not only for China and the United States, but for the whole world. And if that ever happens, Australia's national interest will also be brought to ruins. Therefore, I think all the countries, including uh, Australia, for example, need to urge that China and the United States engage with diplomacy and dialogue rather than escalate the stakes in the South China Sea. I think for the United States to travel at great distance to insert itself militarily, including sending B-52 bombers and uh, uh, aircraft carrier groups, for example, into the South China Sea, as if this would corner China or uh, cause China to back down. No, China will not do that. Both China and the United States are armed to the teeth. Both are nuclear weapons states, so if ever one side or the other uh, does the stupid thing, uh, pushing the situation over the cliff and uh, plunging peace and stability in the South China Sea or more generally in this part of the world into an abyss, every one of us will suffer. Therefore, I think uh, Australia should exercise really great vision and courage and wisdom and go become a better go-between between Washington and Beijing rather than only passively and uh, being dragged along by the events and uh, lose their own initiative of becoming a better force, uh, exercising a better influence over the course of events. Ambassador Brown, talking about go-betweens, how does New Zealand view these rising tensions in the South China Sea? And does it perhaps have a role to play as a facilitator to, you know, lower the temperature in the area? Well, we are obviously concerned about this, the potential for a rise in tension in the region. I listened to what Victor said. I would agree with some of it, and particularly that the, the threat and the impact upon New Zealand and Australia of a serious deterioration in the security situation in the South China Sea would be extremely serious for us. But I don't think one can argue seriously that the United States doesn't have a security role in, in Asia. It's had a security role in Asia since the end of the Second World War it's, and its relationship with countries in Asia is one of close cooperation. It has, through the regional mechanisms such as the ASEAN Regional Forum, it has been involved very deeply with China. And so there are regional methods for, for discussing these issues. There are bilateral channels. These have to be exercised and used actively as far as a role for a country like New Zealand in this, we, have a, we would have a role as a go-between or something only if we were asked to, to do that by both countries. And I think that's pretty unlikely. But we do have a role in regional discussions. We would work, and we have worked, and we will continue to work for diplomacy, for discussion. We will continue to urge all parties in the region to work together in accordance with existing um, mechanisms and uh, new ones that may emerge. James, what is your view on this? Uh, are these tensions over the South, Ch South China Sea uh, just a drag on, a, you know, on the uh, growth of a healthy relationship between Australia and China on the one hand, New Zealand and China on the other? <laughs> 
Um, look, my personal opinion is that a lot of these issues are in fact overblown. Um, if you look at the Australian response to um, what's been happening in the South China Sea, it hasn't been to purely side with the US. Um, that is not correct. Um, we've taken a pretty balanced approach. Um, so we've said that we support the US um, position of being able to run freedom of navigation patrols, but we have chosen not to join them in those patrols. Um, so it's not a case of Australia or New Zealand blindly following the US. Um, we're two countries that are quite capable of making decisions in our national interest. And look, sometimes that m might mean uh, we make our friends in Beijing disappointed, and in other times it might mean we make our friends in Washington disappointed. Think of the Asia, Invest, uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, for example. Um, Australia faced pressure from Washington not to sign up to that. In the end, we signed up to it because we thought it was a good idea um, and it was in our national interest to do so. That's right, Sora. Both Australia and New Zealand are members of the Chinese-led Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank. Uh, and as James just pointed out, Australia faced pressure from the United States not to join. It did join. Does that tell us that ultimately the futures of these two countries are rooted in Asia? The, the, the future of these two countries is indeed rooted in Asia and for Australia especially so and it understands this and it went through a very elaborate in the previous government uh, when, the, when the Labour government was there they put out a document called uh, Australia in the Asian Century which was basically about integrating itself conceptually on, at many levels with, with Asia. Uh, the United States has the liberty and the luxury to think from us that there is a certain gap, there is a certain distance. It can trade with China and at the same time it doesn't necessarily have to be enmeshed in every problem unless it wishes to with China in, in terms of great power contestation in the region. Australia doesn't feel it has that luxury and so it makes the decisions a little bit harder for Australia but the way I would suggest for Australia and Australians to go about this is let me explain. Mm -hmm. Australia has gained great street credibility with Washington. It has been fought with Washington in every war since decades and decades. Mm -hmm. That credibility means you can then talk to Washington in a way in a, and keep Washington honest in a way any other ally can, many other allies cannot, including the Japanese. And I have a tendency sometimes that center-right governments in Australia rather would not, are not, choose not to do that and would rather just put their ear to the ground and hear, try to listen and understand where Washington is going and then follow in that direction. I think Australia can take its destiny in its own hands in a far stronger way and try to be a balance, no, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say balancer, but help to, help to, ameliorate tensions in that part of the world. So when you say it has the ear of the United States, can it act more as a mediator perhaps, a facilitator? Uh, I, th those, those words also are just a little too far for Australia yeah. to go and, and for, I, I would not even suggest that for Australia to go in terms of being a, a, a facilitator of this thing. It is ultimately Washington will make those decisions but Australia can, can speak aloud and take positions which don't necessarily coincide and sometimes might even preempt the American position on a particular issue mm -hmm. and in that way exercise some degree of leverage and control over the issue because if this comes down to what Australia will be on America's side mm -hmm. and that's why it gets that respect for being out there so it can preemptively take positions perhaps in this regard but it is a slightly difficult balancing act and one has to understand it from that perspective. And Victor, what is your view on this? Ultimately, will it be economic the economic relationship between all three countries here, that's going to drive their relationship forward, not these tensions over the South China Sea. I agree with the analysis provided by our uh, panelists from New Zealand about China, uh, New Zealand, and New Zealand-U.S. relations. For Australia, it eventually may end up in a great binder because it has a mutual defense treaty with the United States, which requires Australia to join the military activities of the United States anywhere in the world, regardless of which country the United States may be fighting against. And on the other hand, I think China Australian relations are very good, trade and relations are in the best situation you ever can expect and the prospect will be even brighter. Therefore, I think 
For example, if we really exercise our great wisdom, maybe China and Australia should sign an arrangement requiring mutual non-aggression against each other, for example. And then Australia should ask for a carve-out from its security arrangement with Washington, so that Australia eventually will never end up in a situation where it has to fight against China in partner, because that will be suicidal for Australia and completely destructive to China. So I would say we are not, you know, ossified. People need to really care about their own national interests. And in the world today, China will not, you know, violate any international treaty obligations. And China views Australia as a very friendly country. And there is no fundamental difference of national interest between. Uh, Australia and China, and I would say that we all need to work very constructively with Washington, and we need to advocate dialogue and peace and negotiation between Beijing and Washington whenever there are. Uh, problems or frictions or even confrontations, and we all need to exercise great courage and wisdom to prevent or avoid any confrontation or even escalation to military confrontation between Beijing and Washington. Because if that ever happens, it will bring down the house. It will bring down global peace and stability, and neither China nor the United States will get any real benefit out of that. And all the countries involved will suffer tremendously. Tremendously. That's the mega trend, and we need to see the mega trend and do whatever we can constructively to advocate for peace and stability and avoid escalation of tensions, which eventually may engulf this part of the world in great disasters. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That's it for this edition of the Heat. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington D.C. Thanks for being with us.